Hey guys, welcome back to another reaction video. I had a few minutes here in my office before I broke for lunch and I wanted to uh, do a reaction video. I've been meaning to do this reaction video. I saw Rob Schneider, who I've never been a fan of, just didn't really like his his uh, characters in any of the movies I used to see him in, in the Adam Sandler movies and stuff like that. Uh, but I was fascinated by him and his interview. I, I saw that he did an interview with Tucker Carlson and he was talking about his faith. This clip is about his faith. I think it's about beauty and evil and its role in his faith or something like that. And I saw a picture of the rosaries on the thumbnail, whatever. Anyway, it's Rob Schneider talking about his faith with Tucker Carlson. And I thought, hey, let's watch this together and uh, react to it. So here we go. So I want to circle back to where we began, which is your conversion or your evolution through Christianity, Catholicism. How did that happen? Well, there's two beautiful things. One is to know that that there is far too many stars in the um, in the sky that are necessary for the universe to, to continue. It seems to be, and there's far too much spermazoa and flowers for flowers to continue. And they don't need to be that beautiful color. There seems to be an exuberance in creation. There's just too much. And there seems to be a celebration. This is a general revelation, right? This, he's, he's talking about um, the general revelation that God tells us in Romans 1, that all mankind can see that God exists by his, his creation, by what he has created. We know uh, both by the, the big external things, seeing the flowers and the variations and the design and the creation that God exists, but also your conscience, the internal, is also part of God's creation, that you know God exists because you can tell there is something wrong in your heart, there's something broken. There, you're when you when you sin, you know what sin is, even without being told that sin, because you know it. You know there's something wrong going on there. This sort of thing. But right here, right here, what uh, Rob Schneider's talking about is he's he's talking about the general revelation of God that God has made known to all mankind who He is by His invisible attributes that are you can see the fingerprint of in creation. Oh, very cool. I like it. A celestial whoopee, as Alan Watts would say. And and that's a really beautiful thing. And there's too much exuberance in nature. <laughs> I yeah. love that. And there there's there's definitely a joyfulness to all of it. And it's like, wow, look at that. Sometimes you look up at the clouds and you go like, that's as beautiful as anything that uh, Monet could have ever made. Yes. And it's temporary. And everything is temporary. So that's like the... We get this from uh, Solomon, right? The, 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 the things that are fleeting, everything is vanity, 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 everything is vanity. Uh, it's temporary. It's, it's uh, like our days are, are, are so short and fleeting. Um, think of the Kansas song, right? Dust in the wind, this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's also temporary and yet it's also beautiful. And it is, there is an exuberance in creation. That's a gorgeous thought. When you realize that the pyramids are at their half-life, 5,000 years, and in 5,000 years, there'll be dust. And I go like, wow, how much more so us? And and if you think, um, if our works, whatever we do, if you think our our good works are but dirty rags in the face of the Lord, how much more our pride, our vanity? So that um, came to me by having children and the incredible beauty. Um, and gift that they are and how they see the world and that their eyes point out to see everything and that they know that they're connected to everything and they have to be taught that there's a separation between them and their mother. This is something that they just naturally, they know they're a part of everything. When they ask her. Children opened Rob Schneider's eyes to the reality of God. What a wonderful thing. Out of the mouths of babes, out of the, out of the, the being of our children. And, and we do. If you're honest about this, things like this will hit you when you become a parent. When I became a father, I, you see the world differently. You see the world vocationally as well. He's talking about seeing their wonder and their connection to, to all the different things that God has made, but also your connection to, now you are a steward of this gift that God has given you, this life that, speaking of variations and exuberance, every unique human being, the beauty of these children and you have the privilege as a parent to steward these, these children, these cre creatures of God, that you didn't make them, you were the vehicle in their, in their creation, but God knit them together in their mother's womb. 
God's handiwork is through you. He's using you as a mask, as a tool, as an instrument, and you have the privilege. I had the privilege of being a father, of being a parent, uh, uh, and that responsibility. Uh, that really makes a person understand it if they're if they're being honest and, and if they're looking at it through the biblical lens, what a great privilege it is to be a parent. And, and it does show you God. You can see children. And this is a wonderful thing that Jesus, he points to the little ones when he, he was making the point of who, uh, who inherits er, er, the kingdom of heaven and who, who we are to model ourselves after. I just saw a, pa- a brother pastor on Twitter post this thing about baptizing an infant. And now he said, now I have a role model. This is the newest role model I have. It, you know, how to live as a Christian, in trust in God, um, in de- not independent, but dependent upon the Lord who, who gives us what we need and provides for us. I imagine that you're this little child, one day old and completely dependent upon everyone else. Uh, and, and so God has orchestrated a, an economy, an economy of, of vocations to serve us and to take care of us. And how we ever even get out of day one <laughs> alive is by the grace of God. Very cool. Very cool. Astronauts look back from the moon if they ever went. They they saw one thing. <laughs> if they had gone. If they had gone on the set that they were on. <laughs> were... A little fun there with the moon. The, oh, that's cool. It was shown a picture of In Laurel Canyon, I think. <laughs> they saw the picture of Earth and they saw one thing. And we're that one thing. And then at the same time when and this is coming to me and my beautiful children are that I'm having a second chance at um, to be the father, to be a better father this time, a more present father, um, to see the rise of evil. You hear the repentance in his voice? That's a humble heart. That's a beautiful thing. In the world. And to be concerned about that and to know that now is the time to be courageous. Now is the time for people to step up and say injustice, whether it's the current attack on women, whether it's um, the educational system, not educating kids. I say, take your kids out of college right now. Now is not the time to let your kids go. Who would, who, how much do you have to hate your kids to send them to Harvard undergrad right now? I agree. Come on. Oh my, I just sent my kids back to college. Yes, this is the struggle. I had this, I've been worried all year long about my daughter going off to college. She'd go to a state school and she chose one. Finally, ultimately, uh, price was always the factor, right? And But finally, ultimately, chose one where there is a faithful, confessional Lutheran church that has a college ministry. And I'm praying the Lord keeps her connected to this church. I'm praying that this school she's going to will not corrupt her. Yet what he says, yes, I, I, I wish I had the courage to pull her out, to, to tell her, no, don't go, don't go. Um, and then to be able to give her options and, and things in the future for her I don't know. This is, this is, he's right. He is speaking what I feel and what we all should be feeling and, and doing. And yes, it is a time to be courageous. This is how we live here at St. Mark in Ferndale. We are speaking truthfully, speaking boldly, being courageous. Uh, not everyone wants to hear that. Our neighbors sometimes uh, are, are after us, even those who say they're conservative because they say we're bringing um, the LGBTQ into town or, or we're, uh, we're just ugly and divisive and things because we're pointing out the evil, because we're pointing people to the Lord and calling them to repentance and we're getting flack for it. But now is the time. He is absolutely right. Now is the time to be courageous. And uh, so please pray for my daughter, pray for my son as well. And, and I just hope they're stubborn enough like their father um, to stick, stick with the truth. I think they are. And, and the Lord, my prayer is for him to bless them and protect them, them and every other faithful Lutheran student that they at college, they wouldn't be corrupted. Uh, we this small little congregation I serve is uh, this year alone. We have five college students, four new college students, and one returning college student that are uh, susceptible. We'll be praying for them all year long. Completely. The business schools are great. Don't them still going good? <laughs> They're all conservative too, eighty percent. But um, so you see a rise in evil, and you have to know that like. This is happening. And uh, I've been very blessed that I got to meet some people who educated me about, you know, evil. And in a meeting, Dr. M. Scott Peck, uh, when I was a young, young man, um, and reading his books about the first self-help book was, was, was his. It was The Road Less Traveled. And it was yes. a book about how to be a better person, how to grow as a human being spiritually and not take the easy road. 
of just repetitive behavior or just not learning, not growing, but take the harder road, becoming a better person, learning, loving, being tolerant, being forgiving, being patient, which is, you can easily see how we transitioned into Christianity because he was a Christian without saying. He was just already. Had- this is much like Paul the Areopagus was talking about. You're groping out for the truth. You're, you can see uh, in, in, in many people how they're so close to, and, and they're on the road toward Christian virtue, Christian behavior. This is interesting. Um, and, and Paul mentions that too, you know, that you're, you're extending out, you're groping out for the truth. Let me point you to the one true God, uh, this unknown God that you don't, that you don't even know. Let me, let me show you who he is. And, uh, interesting stuff there. Had the, the followings of Jesus in his heart. And so it was a natural opening. And he had a very interesting story about him about how he was the doctor and the murder of uh, the massacre of my Lai, which is the yes. Vietnam massacre in the late sixties. And he was assigned as a psychologist to, of, by the army, the U S army, uh, to, um, kind of figure out the, um, psychological makeup of the company Baker who did the massacre. Hmm. And so he did. And it was very interesting, his findings. One, one thing is the only reason what we ever learned about the massacre of, of, of My Lai was, um, was because the helicopter pilot who witnessed it flying above couldn't live with it anymore. And so uh, a year later to the day, he confessed and, and, and just said, well, this is what happened. This is, this is what these people were massacred. The truth shall set you free. This is confession. Right. When we hold in our sins, when we deny our sins, when we try to suppress our sins and then to bury them, to sweep them under the rug, it eats us away. Our, our bones rot within us. We become corrupted and, and cantankerous and, and just devoured by sin. But when we confess it, we have to get it out. The truth does set you free. Uh, this is a spiritual reality. It's also, as we're seeing here, as he's talking about this massacre, uh, it is a, a physical reality, too, that when we get it off our chest, so to speak, right, um, we, we can actually breathe because we're not lying to ourselves and to our neighbors. We're not trying to hide. And this is exactly what John tells us in 1 John, that uh, when we deny our sin, we are calling God a liar. But when we confess our sins, right, we, we are coming to him and we're saying he's, he's faithful and good and true and he, he forgives us our sins. So that's why, you know, the Lutheran Church, uh, we, in the, in the historic liturgy, we, we begin with confessing our sins before the Almighty God, who has the ability to destroy us. We come before Him in boldness. We drop to our knees and we say, I am a poor, miserable sinner. And then we, and we can confess. We go to individual confession. We confess the things we've done so that we can live, so that we don't rot away from the inside out. And so during that psychological evaluation, um, which the army never released, he said that these people weren't, were, were people, it wasn't like these particular company had members in it that were, that had some grievances and that they, that they um, you know, had other issues and problems. And some of them maybe had uh, joined the army for, to avoid this or that, or were in prison or whatever. And then that also was just one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is that they were being in a war that um, wasn't get as much support back home. So they were, and they were going through and they were getting sniped at by the enemy, sniper fire, and they were just killing their friends and they, they weren't able to get the enemy. They weren't able to get them. Um, and they just kept happening. And this, by the time they got to a village, they said, where is it? Where is it? Where are they? And the, the people... And this is something that's interesting because it, it, it reflected on my childhood because Asian people, when they are nervous, when they are frightened, they laugh. That is true. When- <laughs> okay. This whole story here about the massacre and stuff, I, I mean, it's interesting information, but I don't know much uh, what to say about it. Like all my relatives, when they are nervous or when they, they laugh, that's their go-to thing. So when the Vietnamese people who were having guns pointed at them were nervous and afraid. They laughed. And these people went ballistic at that point and just murdered the entire village, just murdered them all, killed them all. Um, And so he did this and and handed it in and um, the army never released it. So moving further, um, 
He wrote a book about um, after he became uh, he became a Christian, and then wrote a book about uh, healing human evil called called People of the Lie. And it's a short book, but very good book about evil. And it's important now to identify and to help heal human evil. And Absolutely. The People of the Lie, check that out. See if uh, you can find that at bookshop.org through Butterfat Books or something. Sounds interesting. It's a, it's a fascinating book, but it helps you identify people in your life and people who um, are capable and who are, who are evil. And evil does exist. And we need to uh, arm ourselves with uh, with God and arm ourselves with knowledge so we can protect ourselves for what's what's a rise in evil. And um, this is the armor of light comes to mind, right? Speaking, maybe it's because he was talking about the war and things like that. But uh, yet there is a, there's a, there's two camps, right? Some people think that men are inherently good. Mankind is inherently good or inherently evil. Now the Bible tells us we are evil. We're born, we're conceived in sin. We're evil from the beginning and, and we become good or can become good by by the Spirit working faith in our heart and, and bringing us to our knees in confession, repentance of our sin through baptism, b- being made new. Our old evil man, the old Adam within us, is drowned in the waters of baptism, and the new man is given birth uh, to be reborn, born again, born from above in baptism, to be a whole new creature, a, a creature made in the image of God. In the image of Christ, wearing Christ, literally, Paul talks about, as we wear him. And the Lord sees us as that forgiven creature, that new man. And um, again, when we go to communion, and we do it, we should do it as regularly as possible. Here at St. Mark, we do it every week. And this is because every week we need to confront our sins and, and put down that evil that wants to rise back up, slay that sinner within us once again. And we do this daily, even in our prayerful life, our confession of sins in our, in our prayers. Uh, Luther's great about talking about how every time you, like, you wash your face, think about your baptism. So when you get out of, the, out of the shower and you wipe off that mirror, if you if you do that and you streak up your mirror, you should be thinking about wiping the, the sin and the, the filth off of you, the evil away, and how that's been done in baptism. And daily you live in repentance and, and confession of your sin and the absolution that comes through Christ Jesus. The last chapter of the book, well, the, well one of the chapters, which is really stunningly awful was this one kid who was depressed and he went to go see Dr. M. Scott Peck and he, he found out that his brother had killed himself. Yeah. And, um, and he, was, he realized this is a really good kid, you know, and he's depressed, obviously his brother killed. And then he found out that for um, a birthday present, his, his parents gave him a gun. And it's like that. It was just absolutely stunned. And, uh, but it wasn't just that it was the same gun that his brother killed himself with. So there was a, a realization these, and he talked to the parents and realized there were, these were evil people. And so that potentiality for human evil, we need to recognize and help heal, protect ourselves, protect our families. And um, the last chapter on it, which is uh, demonic and satanic possession. And it was like, you know, I'm reading this book. It's three o'clock in the morning at this point. I'm starting to freak out <laughs> like this. And, um, but he postulated this theory. He said, like, the people who seem to be um, possessed seem to be very angelic people that this entity is trying to overtake. And they're fighting back for it to free themselves. And evil, even evil, they, it has to succumb to the will and this, and of Jesus Christ. and my- Amen, right? Christ overpowers the demons in Scripture. He, he drives them into the swine. He, he, he casts them out of people. The devil is not equal to God. Demons are not a match for Christ. The entire legion of demons is no match for the one Son of God. I'll submit to it. Which he, the, the, the theory that he postulates, well, this is somebody who's fighting back. So therefore, it makes sense that there are people who don't fight back and just accept it and go with that. And that kind of, mm. that demonic possession becomes complete. And I think we have to, we have to, uh, to know that that's, uh, that's something that um, exists, is real, human evil. 
whatever you want to call it. And so what Dr. M. Scott Peck in the bigger picture tried to explain was that like, obviously science and theology had to split at a certain point to survive because theology was um, crushing science. Yes. When you have, um, when Copernicus discovers that the sun is a solar, you know, the beginning of the the middle of our solar system, not the earth, and it's not part of the church doctrine that has to be recanted. It's obviously, science had to split. So you had the, the the laws of nature, which is just, you know, they just took the lawmaker out. And they still the laws, you know, just like we have yes. theological laws. So when you have... Yeah, because, and that's something it's, that's very interesting to point out because many people in the world think the laws of nature are, are law, they are our observations of our creator's design. Right, the laws of nature. They are, as we talk about them, they are what we observe to be true. When when an apple falls, gravity pulls it to the ground. Right, but who made that law? Who established that law? So what he's, he's right there in talking about how science is, it, it, as it split from theology, it all they did was remove God. Now there's a problem with that. We see we see the problem today that we see that science is is weaponized against theology, trying to to prove theology wrong and 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 pit against faith and theology in Christ. and um, But no, the reality is where there is, and, and C.S. Lewis is great about teaching this, that where, where you see the law, there is a law maker. There is a law giver who put that law in place. We observe it. We identify it. We can, we can articulate it to some degree as we study it. But we didn't write it into creation. God did. Have that separation. What Dr. M. Scott Peck tried to do was to bring it back together. So when somebody's like a murderer or somebody's bad, you know, in, sci- in science, medicine, you call them sick. Theologically, you call them evil. They're one and the same. So in, in the attempt to... I sometimes use the language sin sick when I'm dealing with showing how the Lord forgives sins and he's healing uh, in the text and the scriptures. Uh, and he does that. There's a parallel there of what he does physically is connected to what he does spiritually. And so there is a there is this sin that we like I said we were conceived in our sin we have our trespasses that we we commit and and these these spiritual it's a spiritual sickness that we have and it's a spiritual healing that we need and so this is why you know when the Lord forgives the uh, the paralytic man of his sins um, and and then he sort of to show them the reality he also heals the man but the greater thing that the Lord does is forgive sins. It is the spiritual healing is much greater than physical healing because our spiritual healing, this will have eternal ramifications. You will live forever with Christ because you have been spiritually healed. And why we refer to communion as the medicine of immortality, as a forgiveness of sins that heals us for immortality with Christ. But to just heal your body, well, your body's going to die eventually. Right? I mean, the, the paralyzed man was able to walk, great, but, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. He's dead. He's dead at this point. So uh, what was the greater gift, the greater blessing of, from our good physician was to heal his soul from his sin sickness, from the evil within him? To cure human evil, I think it's, um, it makes us, we need to, to do both and to work together. And I think through, through bringing people closer to God, bringing our nation, which was founded under God, I think we have a chance to heal our nation and and because there is a rise in evil and I think we all see it. So the, it's it sounds like you're saying the rise in evil turned you toward God. Well, I think I think both bookends. The beauty of it and my children and the beauty of of seeing of seeing what God's gifts are and there's so many and the um and also but to, also to be I, you have to recognize that this you know whether it's a cycle or what what happens you know that there is evil. There seems to be a rise in evil in the world and what's yes. happening. And just like with, you know, in Europe in the 1920s. Yes. Um, this is interesting. The bookends, the beauty and the evil, the ugliness uh, and the beauty pointed Rob Schneider toward God. When we think about the liturgy, we think about church and the beauty that we have in the ancient liturgy that, was, that, is, that formed and, and was given to us from the apostles and developed out of biblical understanding, oftentimes uh, reflecting or mirroring or being the shadow of uh, what the, the, or the fulfillment of the shadow of the Old Testament and the Levitical behaviors and things like this. 
uh, but now free in the gospel to do it or not do it and then use that, that beauty of knowing we're in, we're in the presence of God and being reverent about it and being intentional about it and everything's in order. Beauty is order. And our God is not a God of chaos, but of order. And so on a Sunday morning, when you come into a church that has appreciation for the, the ancient biblical liturgical practices flowing out of the communion uh, table, the Lord, Lord's table, you see that. And that is, the, that is in, in contrast to the ugliness of the world. You come into the ark of the church on a Sunday morning and, and you, are, you are escaping the, the t- torrential storm of the world that happens outside, is still happening outside, and that you live in every day of the week. So you do, you have the, the, the bookend, you have the evil that you see, you confront on a daily basis. You see, even within your own heart, how wretched you are. And then you have the beauty of God and His, His establishment of His church through the Holy Spirit and and all the gifts, that, like Rob points out, all the gifts that he gives us, and there's, there's, there's so many, there's so various, there's, uh, it's just a, a plethora of, of blessings. And then both of these things do point you to, to God. Um, and so that, that makes me think of like these contemporary churches, these culturally oriented churches that, that worship like they see the world. So church becomes a rock concert. Well, rock concert is, is disordered. People are doing their own things. Hands are waving everywhere. People are moving about and everything's, everything's chaotic at a rock concert. You may enjoy the music. You may enjoy the experience personally because you live in this culture of ours. But think about that. It is disordered and chaotic. Even the sounds are, are amelodic. And then they're, they're organized in a way where there's, there's some rhythm and stuff in there. But it is meant to be you know, the metal and, and the backbeat and all this kind of stuff. There's, it's, there is an order to it. Sure, I don't want to get don't go too far with that, but, but it is not the same kind of order and harmony that you get in church. And so when we bring the world's behavior, the pagan worship, and that's where all of our modern rock music is coming from, is pagan um, roots, and we bring that and we form a church service based around that, well, you, didn't, you don't have the, the contrast between the beauty and the evil to point you to God. And that's something to think about there. The New York Times called these small group of people, a bunch of misfits and nothing will ever come of them, the National Socialists. I think we need to be very careful how we move. And I, and I believe the United States must continue to be um, the guide and for the world as an example of freedom, not perfect freedom, not, not a perfect society by any stretch, but a one that, that aims for equality that aims to be able to express itself, which and free speech is the beacon call for freedom in the world. And they're, you know, nobody's swimming away from America. <laughs> they're not trying to get out. They're trying to get in for a reason because this is the greatest experiment in freedom in human history and continues to be. And we must fight and be vigilant. And now's the time for courage to protect it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's so many parallels and connections, and there's a reason why our experiment has been so great is because it was founded on biblical Christian ideals, and and not just ideals, but men who were who were saying we are dedicating this establishment of of Massachusetts or whatever it was, our, this colony. God was infused in that. We we oftentimes think that there was no such thing as a you know of the church in the state when we got here that that it was completely divorced. The church and state were separate. That's not true. Uh, the, the state constitutions, there was no federal church. There was no national church. But for many, many years, the state constitutions were, the, the church was there. There was, a, there was a Christian reality in the state documents, the, the, the individual states. And, and then even the establishment of our uh, uh, national constitution, our national identity, it is built on those Christian principles and those Christian men who infused that, that glory to God in their efforts, that God would bless their efforts, the divine, the providence would bless their efforts. Um, perfectly, no. Do we, do we do it all perfectly? No, there never will be a perfect thing on, on this side of the resurrection. But he's right, and, the, and that connection to free speech, who is the author of speech? Well, we hear in John 1, right? The logos became incarnate. The word became, became flesh. Speech is so important communication. God is communication. He communicates with us. 
and this is why. So anyway, interesting. Um, I'm always now I'm, so, I'm going to be sorry that uh, I've always said I didn't like Rob Schneider as an actor, but I love this video and everything he said. That's great. All right, guys. See you in the next video. Thanks for tuning into this reaction. Like, subscribe, and uh, follow. Click the notification bell for more of these videos and for all the other things we got going on here at the channel. Truth at all cost every Saturday and morning. We have live Bible studies every Tuesday morning, and we have sermons that drop every Sunday evening, and then things like this that drop when I have time. So God's blessings to you, and we'll talk to you in the next video.